Okay. Hello. Welcome everyone to today's Trial Talk Live. Today we have Judith Cox and she's going to be sharing her passion for fairy gardens. Uh, Judith has also done a previous talk for Trial Talk Live on tomatoes. So if anybody um, wants to look that up, you can find it on our Master Gardener YouTube channel. Um, Judith also has um, grows heritage vegetables as well as roses. So she's very knowledgeable to answer any of those questions that you may have. And so now we look forward to Judith's talk. Take it away, Judith. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about growing a fairy garden inside. Now, this is a new one on me because usually I grow my fairy gardens outside. Belle and I like to grow our fairy gardens uh, in nice shallow pots. We use the four elements of fire, air, water, and earth. The fire is represented here with the red flowers or with little candles. The air, well, there's a little pinwheel there. The water is a small dish that is buried into the soil filled with pebbles so that the butterflies, bees, and dragonflies can have a drink without drowning. And of course, earth with rocks and things like that. I also like to put in herbs because that way it makes it even more functional. And calling it a fairy garden, it's lots of fun with all the accessories, but really what I like to see it is as, is as a uh, pollinator garden. It's giving water to all the little insects that I'd like to keep around, and there is some nectar there for them and pollen as well. Sometimes I'm getting, when I'm growing fairy gardens outside, I have problems with squirrels and chipmunks digging in the pot. So one time I covered the whole area with little stones and that helped a lot. Then I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I put one of my solar lights in my fairy garden and it lit all up at nighttime and kind of looked uh, spooky, which I thought was cool. But these are pollinator gardens, and I don't really have many pollinators in my house. So I thought, what am I going to do to bring a fairy garden or that kind of atmosphere inside? I know in the winter time, I'm always looking for ways to make myself feel better so I don't have to deal with all that snow. So what a great idea to try something inside. Well, what am I going to need? So I sat down and I made a list. I thought, first of all, I'm going to need a container. Now the container that I would like to have will be large, but not tall. I'd like it to be shallow and wide so that I have room for lots of small plants and accessories and I can move things around. I need to establish an area where this fairy garden is going to be. I'd like to put it somewhere where it's not going to get moved a lot. If we move it around the house, then the accessories are going to tip over and the plants are not going to be happy. We don't wanna keep disturbing them. Speaking of plants, I want to make sure that the plants I select are safe for animals. I have way too many cats, so I need to be sure that these plants are not poisonous or pointy in any way. And if you have children or grandchildren, you don't want anybody tasting your fairy garden and getting sick. The other thing is I need to decide what kind of accessories I'm going to put in there. Now you can go and spend a fortune at little boutique fairy garden shops, or you can take your imagination and go to the dollar store and have a field day. And that's what I do. Although I do tend to hold on to a few things. So most of the accessories I've found so far were in a box here and there. So downstairs, I went to the basement and I found a container. It's large, it's a kind of funky color, and it's shallow, and it's wide. Perfect. I took it outside to put the soil in. If I put the soil in when I'm in the house, guaranteed I'm going to spill it everywhere, and then that's going to be a mess. 
So I filled it up outside. Now, if you notice, I did not use a seed starting soil. They are very light. And I don't want light, light soil because all my accessories will sink. On the other hand, I don't want to use my garden soil or black earth or anything like that because it's too heavy. And it'll make the planter heavy and it'll be difficult for my plants to break through. You can see that there's uh, Right here, you can see little bits of vermiculite. And also with most potting soils that you buy, they will have a slow release fertilizer, which means that my plants will not need anything to eat for quite some time. So I like the look of it, but I left it here for a while because I watered it. I wanted to be sure that the water had saturated. A lot of the times when you get a potting mix and you put a bit of water on it, you'll see the water beads up on top. You want to make sure that it soaks in and it's ready to go for planting. Now, now I needed to find where I'm going to put my fairy garden. And I thought it'd be really cool if I put it on my dining room table so that I would be able to look at it whenever I'm having supper and when I'm walking by. Now, when I clear off the dining room table, um, with the exception, of course, of this bowl of uh, excess Christmas decorations that the cats like to play with, um, the pussycats find this surface to be just wonderful. So I had to very carefully negotiate with Tula to say, you know, I'd like to put my fairy garden here. The next thing I had to do was to go around the house and select some plants. Now in my front window, I have trees of scented geraniums. They are all um, citrus based. I discovered that pussycats do not like citrus. And for the first time in a long time, I'm able to grow plants out of the compound. So here at the back is a rose skeleton geranium. They get very tall, so I don't think they would be a good idea. Right here is a freshem lemon geranium, has a lovely, fresh, sharp lemon scent. And right here we have Prince of Orange, nice orange scent. So I wouldn't go too far wrong with these guys. In the back where the, um, some of my plants like to get a little bit of summer breeze, I have my dragon fruit. You can see it's very large. Here it is in the pot. It used to be quite tiny but it grew and grew and grew. I grew it from a supermarket dragon fruit seed um, and it's just been lovely. However, uh, the kitties do like to chew on it from time to time. The aloe, it's too big. It's going to take over the planter and I won't have room for my accessories and everything else on the shelf was a scented geranium. So off I go to the compound and look around and I have a Mona lavender. That's this one here. I love this plant. I love how it constantly has these little purple flowers. It's just a treat, but it is too tempting for kitties. And in front of it, you can see the little teeth marks. So not a good idea for any of the Christmas or Easter cactuses. Over here, my orchid has stopped blooming. But again, it will get chewed on. I could see somebody doing a beautiful orchid fairy garden. You'd have to use the orchid medium, of course, but you could make all orchids around the edge and then make a tropical island or something like that. That would be interesting. And my daughter's a forensic scientist, so she will often put surprise skulls in my compound just for a laugh, if you're wondering. The African violets, you can get African violets that are so tiny, you could have several and make your fairy garden featuring those little tiny African violets. And but the kitties, nope, they're into those. And you can see my poor toothache plant with all of the jagged edges. Uh, somebody was chewing on that when I put it out to enjoy a summer breeze. So nope, it's staying where it is. There's my compound. I bless it. I couldn't do seedlings in the spring without it. So here I have got my big pot and I thought 
one of the big problems we have sometimes is that even though the pot has drainage, if it's flush to the um, plate, then it won't drain. So I like little stones or pebbles down and sit the pot up on top of that. Now this plate turned out to be too small, so I put it on a silver tray instead. Silver colored. There it is. So it's on this tray on top of uh, pebbles. And I used over here, I used the Freshem Lemon uh, Scented Geranium. And this is a rose scented geranium. Now this one won't get as big as the rose skeleton scented geranium. So I think they will do just fine as my starter plants for the fairy garden. I thought, okay, it's time for accessories. Time to have a little bit of fun here. So I picked up a little wooden house at the dollar store and some uh, water, uh, um, you clean it up with water, the uh, acrylic paint, yes, uh, and went to town and made myself a little fairy house. Now, you can do that yourself, or what a wonderful thing for your kids to do. They can make little houses. There's all sorts of little wooden things to do. Also, they have a, a huge selection of little wooden buildings and accessories at Michael's. One time when I was uh, working with some children building a fairy garden, we were getting into painting, but one of them wanted to make a Lego building. And I thought, that's a great idea. Use your Lego and make a Minecraft fairy garden. You can do anything you want. It's your fairy garden. By the way, that is the dragon fruit a few years ago. It's a lot smaller in that pot. Another thing we did with that particular fairy garden is that we put a little teeny tiny tea set in it. And that was lots of fun. Okay, so here I have my house. I have my plants uh, for my earth element. Look, I have these lovely big rocks and a giant chicken because who doesn't need a giant chicken in their fairy garden? And this thing right here, that is from the dollar store. It's a, a battery operated light. So at nighttime, I can turn on these teeny little fairy lights and have the whole thing lit up. I could make them nice and sparkly different colors for Halloween and Christmas and Valentine's Day and change it up. So that is actually a lot of fun, great ideas. I found a box of old Lego and I put a, um, a crocodile in here and a scientist examining the giant chicken. And oh, look, there's a little Lego person who doesn't want to come out and a, um, a watering can. And then when my children were walking by, my children are much older now, they thought it was a hoot and they're wandering around looking in their rooms to see if they have anything that they'd like to add to the fairy garden. You can make your fairy garden an actual part of your whole existence. It would be a lot of fun to do. Now I have the, uh, right here, I have the rocks for the earth element. And here I found a little wind indicator and that will be my air element. And here I found my water element, a little wee sculpture with a little bit of a pond. And this, of course, the lights, that'll be my fire element. So now I have everything covered and I'm all set to go. Also, I found a few other accessories that I could use. There's some Halloween decorations. I can pick up more of those if I want to. I could even maybe take a couple of tiny pumpkins out of my garden and put them in. They don't have to be in there for very long. And uh, well, there's a snowman for winter and there's a little gate for Christmas time. Uh, the world's your oyster. Go to town. Have lots of fun with it. Use your imagination, especially if you can get children involved. That would be great. Here he is all lit up for, uh, for the night. I uh, put it on around six o'clock and then I turn it off before I go to bed. And it just makes my day to see this happy, shiny little fairy house. Are there any questions? I 
I was just wondering uh, if you could think of some other plants that we might use, uh, Judith, while we're waiting for some questions. Uh, I was thinking about even things that are small, like succulents, hens and chicks type yes. things. You know? a, lot of, a lot of people use succulents in the fairy garden, definitely. Uh, and that would work well. I found sometimes inside that they don't do as well as they do outside, but it all depends on the plant. I was just mm -hmm. thinking too, maybe some miniature roses, that would be something. You would have to though, keep an eye on your plants. They don't get too leggy and they don't overwhelm the fairy garden. So you'd probably have to do some minimal pruning all the way through when you're looking after it. Another question I had is I wonder if you use something like miniature roses and then you ended up with some pests because we do get, ah. um, uh, you know, do you have to sort of dismantle and clean everything, your accessories and? It really depends on the pest. Usually uh, with the roses inside, uh, I found that they, they will come with their own personal fungus gnats. Mm -hmm. um, and when you buy them, so what I do is I take it out and I actually remove uh, some of the earth and check it very, very carefully because you'll find them underneath the soil as well. And if you have a problem like that, you want to, ice, you want to clean the rose and isolate it for a good 48 hours before it goes into your um, fairy garden. Once you've cleaned them all up, the, usually there isn't a problem. Okay. Um, and, and Judith can answer questions other than fairy garden questions, uh, if, if, you know, especially uh, she's quite a tomato <laughs> expert and uh, I know that we- <laughs> I am a tomato woman. <laughs> yes. Uh, and the last thing is, would you consider, um, people are into bonsai, right? Uh, some people are into bonsai yes. and you could almost treat some of your plants like uh, trim them up like bonsai to keep them tiny for fairy gardens. Yes, you could. You could definitely bonsai your plants. The big thing is you want to sort of pinch out the new growth as it comes along to make it nice and soft and bushy. Uh, what you want to be sure of is as you're pruning, you want to look through the plant to make sure no branches are overlapping and you've got a good clean airflow going through in the area. Sometimes if we bush our plants up too much, then we uh, end up with little bits of problems of no airflow and then you get into your molds and things like that. You want to be careful with that. You also want to be sure when you're watering, I like to make sure you know, if you're on the city water, you want it to sit for 24, 48 hours before you start watering with it. It's just better for your plants. Okay, I have a couple of questions. So one here on tomatoes uh, ah. from Eva saying, my tomatoes are giants, uh, two hey. meters, mm -hmm. and I'm tempted to cut them since I do not support trellis, since maybe just doesn't have a support trellis. Is yeah. this a good time to cut indeterminate tomatoes? Yes, yes, you can cut your indeterminate tomatoes without losing a lot of fruit. But what you want to do is cut where you see any kind of a stress point. If something is really pulling on your on the branches or if there's an area you think is weaker than the others, then you want to free that up. And again, airflow, because they don't like to be overly crowded. And the indeterminates, if they get really, really big like that, then there's not a good airflow going through. And you're going to see... Um, you're going to see like a, a, a branch like this with a little one coming up in between. And it's a little in between guys that you want to pinch out of there. Okay. Another question from Adette, would you know where or when fairy gardens originated? Just curious. I believe that's a Victorian thing. They started a way back as a way to uh, entertain children um, about the fairies at the bottom of the garden. However, uh, what was more prevalent were uh, gnomes. They were really into gnomes and pixies rather than fairies and, um, and hermits and things like that. You used to be able to hire a hermit to live in your garden if you were very rich. Wow. I know. Um, 
<laughs> Kelly's just asking to, uh, for you to remind us of the four necessary elements or features. Oh, the four elements are fire, water, earth, and air. Now, you don't get into the metals because that they're not crazy about metals. And if you want to keep fairies out, you put down pennies. They don't like copper. Oh, hey. Okay. Um, another from what I've for... read, I don't. I've never talked to a pair fairy personally, but from what I've read. <laughs> and another tomato question from Eva: yep. rusty spots on tomatoes and leaves dying on some plants. What to do? There are so many reasons. Um, first of all, they're not crazy about this humidity. Uh, second of all. Uh, you want to be sure you are watering them regularly and feeding them regularly. And by feeding, I mean, be very, very careful with the chemical fertilizers because you can easily overfeed your tomato. I use a liquid uh, fish emulsion fertilizer because I'm not going to burn anything with that. Uh, often too, you'll get a later blight. Sometimes if we have a hard rain, the rain will uh, lay down on the soil, the soil will jump up on the leaf and that will make the leaf sort of a yellowy brownie color and, and it will die. Uh, there are many diseases with tomatoes, you, but that's, that's sort of a, a kind of a general idea of what you're dealing with. Um, and, and Brenda was asking about uh, what causes late blight and how do you prevent it? With the late blight, usually it's a watering issue as well, but it's stuff that gets on the leaves. And when we have humidity like this, it's, it, they're just all set for that. Also, the blight is in your soil. If you have composted your previous tomatoes or tomato cuttings, it will overwinter and it'll come out again later on your tomatoes. So be very careful with that. If you buy tomato plants, instead of, um, instead of growing them from seed, um, often the uh, tomato plants that you buy, depending on where you buy them, sometimes they have been exposed to blight spores, and that's going to come out later in the season. Um, when you are finished with your tomatoes, even if they look healthy, you put them in the green bin, but you do not put them in your compost. Your compost isn't hot enough to kill those blight spores and they will be back every year from then on. Okay, good. I, I don't have any more questions right now, but I just want to make a comment. I, I, um, I did a fairy garden uh, years ago when my granddaughter was young, basically because Judith influenced me that it would be a wonderful thing to do. And um, the fairy went missing from uh, our garden when we went out one morning and my granddaughter just couldn't understand. So I had sent uh, an email to, um, to Judith and I was asking her and Judith said, I mean, we knew that an, an animal, a squirrel had taken it. I found it later in the fall in another part of the garden. But Judith told me to tell my granddaughter that fairies go to where they're needed. And obviously that fairy needed to go somewhere because my little granddaughter was a little broken hearted when it disappeared and we were so glad to find it in the fall. Aww. So she's always got a, um, as someone mentioned, thank you for your charming talk, Judith. She's always got a lovely, charming way of dealing with uh, garden or fairy catastrophes. <laughs> well, children are very, um, they believe in fairies and they see little things and you don't want to tell them these things aren't there. You want to be able to say to them, you know, what are you seeing and how do you think this works and uh, stuff like that. I, I think it's wonderful to have magic in, in your life. I think it makes your life much better. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. So if that's all the questions that we have for today, I want to thank Judith. I think you've given us lots of inspiration to go um, create our own fairy garden, whether indoors or outdoors. Um, it's a great way, as you've mentioned, to involve children in gardening and introduce them that way, or just to bring out the child in all of us. And I think we can all use more of that. 
So I thank you again, so. everybody, for joining us. And next week we have um, Penka will be talking on our late season perennial color. So that's something that's going to interest lots of people. So stay tuned for that. Thank you. <laughs>